My career as a classical harp player has taken me all over the world and opened my eyes and ears to the incredible potential of this instrument. Despite that, I actually know very little about its construction or its history. I'm on my way to the Salvi factory in the village of Piasco near Turin in Italy. It's the largest harp factory in the world and the first stop on my journey of discovery. in the harp factory, there's a lot of wood. Um, can you tell me what, what, what they are? What is this wood? This is maple. Okay. Maple from Canada. Actually. Right. And here on the right? Here you see beech wood. Beech wood, uh, not in single, not massive wood, but uh, laminated. Yeah. And uh, this makes it more elastic. Right. Okay. And then finally, is this the same maple here? That's the exactly the, the same maple. The harp seems to be common to practically every culture. In its simplest form, it probably developed from the huntsman's bow. Many pictures, carvings and statues of early harps have survived from ancient Egypt, Assyria and Mesopotamia. But nearly 80 years ago, there was a fascinating discovery. In 1929, archaeologists from Pennsylvania, the British and Baghdad Museum made a most remarkable find. 80 feet down in a grave, what seemed to be a royal grave in Ur in present-day Iraq, they discovered a grave with 46 courtiers who had gone to their death, apparently committing suicide with their queen. Amongst the graves, there were three or four harps, lyres. These harps were approximately 5,000 years old, older even than the pyramids and Stonehenge. Technically speaking, they were lyres, but harps and lyres belong to the same family of instruments, sharing a similar sound and playing technique. Andy Lowings has spent years recreating one of these beautiful instruments, sourcing the exact same raw materials and making it possible for us to hear the sound of the original harp. Ethiopia they still play an instrument which is very similar to the one discovered in Iraq. Ethiopians believe that this was the instrument King David played to Saul in the Old Testament. I've come here to Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, to meet the master of this ancient instrument, Alamu Aga. This instrument is used exclusively for religious purposes, specifically in the services of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. It's never played for fun or for parties. Well, this is a traditional uh, musical instrument of Ethiopia called Bagana. It is an uh, Ethiopian harp. Yeah. And when you play it, it has a sort of a, a buzzing on yes. each string. What causes that? Uh, it is caused by these laser uh, pieces, yeah. which are called uh, buzzers. Right. And so when you move them up and down, yes. for example, maybe you can see uh, when the string comes in touch with the bridge, uh -huh. it, it, it creates a buzzing sound, for example. Now it is not buzzing. Right. When I move it down, and it rests on the... Oh, now it buzzes. Yeah, I see. OK, so you can control the buzzing then? Yes. That's something you yes. control. Can you show me, show me how to play? OK. You will use it with your left hand. It has to come on this shoulder? Yes. So it has to be like this. Right. 
So I have to touch your hand. Yeah, it's fine. So I'll make you uh, show the position of the fingers. This one rests here, like this. And this one here, maybe down like that. Yeah. So this finger plucks this one and rests on this one. So you I pluck. see. Yes, like that. All these four fingers, yeah. they plug uh, towards you, except the thumb yeah. against, yes, like that. So you start from the lowest tone to the highest. This I'll one? I'll show you. No, with this one. Okay. This. All right. Then with this one, the middle finger. Then uh, the thumb. Then... The lyre was prevalent throughout Europe in the early centuries of the first millennium and was often used for the accompaniment of court poetry, such as the Gododin, an early epic Welsh poem dating from the 6th century. The triangular harp, that is a harp with a front pillar as we would recognise it today, first appears in Europe in the 8th or 9th century, in the far north of Britain. Now, the Picts were a tribe of people in the highlands of Scotland oh. and in the lowlands, but they didn't leave any written language. Instead, they left some beautiful carved stones which present images of objects they knew, animals, birds, humans, and indeed harps appear there. The harps that they show are very simple ones. They tend to be triangular, yeah. having um, straight arms and straight pillars. And um, they're sometimes being shown played by people sitting in chairs or just freely floating in, in the, the, the scenery. Um, it's interesting that there's about a dozen representations of harps on these stones, and they all are found on Christian stones. No one knows what these early Pictish harps would have sounded like. None survived and the carvings are not detailed enough to allow us to recreate them. However, this is the sound of the Bray harp, the harp that would have been common across Europe from the 12th to the 16th century. It's called a bray harp because it brays like a donkey. It buzzes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because it's fitted with little wooden pegs which hold the strings into the sound box. Right. And they very lightly touch the strings and they cause them to buzz. Which we call the brays. That's right. The bray. Okay. The bray pins are, you know, give, give the bray harp its distinctive sound. Yeah. And I've got a couple with me here. They're just little crooked wooden pegs. Right. At right angles that fit into the box. And this is music that would have been played on the harp in the late Middle Ages. We can bring it alive thanks to the survival of a unique manuscript now housed in the British Library. This manuscript dates from 1613, but is a record of a much earlier oral tradition, the court harp music of Wales which was collected and transcribed by Robert App Hugh, a harpist from Anglesey. It's beautiful to look at, but the way it works is also very beautiful. This is a stave, if you like, and this middle line separates the treble hand from the 
bass hand. So this is the bass hand and that's the treble hand. It's the earliest surviving collection of harp music anywhere in Europe. Musicologists have spent years attempting to decipher the unique tablature used to write down this sophisticated music. Each piece is constructed around one of 24 musical patterns, based on a binary system. These were known as the 24 measures of string music. First of all, we get a column with their names yeah. in Welsh, like Macamun Hir, Corfinur, Corskolov, and the thing about these names is that m quite a few of them don't really make sense in Welsh. Yeah. And they do seem to be borrowed words from Irish. Right. They seem to be okay. Irish names, even. Here to Glendaloch in the Wicklow Mountains on the trail of the age old connections between the Welsh and Irish harping traditions. This ancient monastic settlement is the spiritual home of the harp here in Ireland. documentary evidence that a meeting was held here in Glendaloch in the 11th century between musicians from Wales and Ireland to set down the 24 measures of string music. This would imply that this music was common to both cultures, although the sound of the medieval Irish harp was very different. The main biggest difference is the strings. The strings are metal, in this case brass and bronze. So if you were to play a, 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 like a chord, how would you have so there's a lot, of, and you play with your fingernails. Yeah, play with fingernails. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, that's the would you call that? That would be the, the medieval Irish harp. Right. The medieval design with the willow sandbox is the only way to go, really. If you you could give me a crash course on on that pew, what, what would we start with? What, okay. What's the main sort of? Uh, well, there's a simple piece, Kenya Equin Pipit. Um, Basically, the, the whole Apu system is based on, the whole music is based on measures. Right. You've got these 24 measures. They can get very complicated, but in this piece, they're quite simple. They just go. So. One, one, zero, yeah. zero. So you could have one, 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 zero, 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 one, zero, but only one, zero. two chords? Yeah. Yeah. Or two related chords. You could have the chords get real fancy sometimes. You could have like something like. Oh. Oh, well, and that would be that would be a 0.8 or something. No, they're still ones. Oh, they're still ones. They're still ones, but they're fancy ones. <laughs> okay. So yeah. then, to because you'd think you could do anything with this kind of simple, that it would be very boring. But they actually invented quite a few. Uh, the melody starts not on the bass anywhere. We didn't get that far, we didn't get that far, that's not fair, that's, that's, that's ace, that was good, that was good. The wire-strung clasach or Irish harp and the bray harp was central to Welsh, Irish and Scottish music traditions right up to the 17th century. With the renaissance of interest in all things Celtic at the end of the 19th century, and again with the more recent folk revival of the 60s and 70s, the Celtic harp was reinvented a hybrid of the ancient harps and the modern concert harp. At the cutting edge of that revival was Alan Stivell.
years after he captured the imagination of young people across Europe with his revolutionary approach to Celtic music, Alan is still playing and still experimenting. I went to meet him while he was rehearsing for a concert during his latest tour and asked him how he came to play the harp. Uh, because of my father, you know, my daddy, uh, wanted to make a revival of the Celtic harp in Brittany and I was a, a child and uh, when I saw this harp being built uh, it was something so fantastic for me and especially when the first strings were put on I was taken by the magic by the magical uh, you know uh, the magic of yeah, the, the harp, yeah. of the sound yeah when then did you start electrifying harps when did the whole electric so around the same time when my father made his first metal strings harp I was myself uh, already involved in uh, in the beginning of uh, rock and roll and uh, yeah. and, uh, and American folk music and so on. So and, and of, of even uh, Indian music and instruments like that. So the metal strings harp uh, there was something which are, was at the same time more together with the the sound coming from outside ah. in the uh, in our in my generation but also something which in a way was more Celtic than the nylon strings or the goat strings oh, yeah. in, my, in my spirit, in my feeling. By 1617, when Robert Apphew was transcribing his manuscript, music was changing dramatically in Europe. Under the influence of the Renaissance and subsequently the Baroque movement, music was becoming more sophisticated and composers were expecting more flexibility from instruments. This was beyond the capabilities of the Klarsach or the Bray harp. If the harp was to survive, it had to develop quickly. And this was the result, the triple harp. A harp with three rows of parallel strings which enabled the player to change keys without retuning. A true chromatic instrument. Um, an attempt at producing chromatic notes really in the old days in, in the Renaissance um, sometimes they'd have two rows of strings with the rows overlapping slightly mm. they'd tune say one to an F sharp and one to an F yes. and then somebody had the bright idea well why not just make both outsides diatonic do re mi like the white notes of the piano yeah. and then on the third row in between you have the, the chromatic, chromatic notes yeah. So you reach through from either side with either thumb or any of the fingers playing where and whenever you need a chromatic note in the piece. The whole idea of multi-row harps probably started in Spain and there they had a harp with two rows of strings but the two rows crossed over and sort of interlaced like this. What? In the middle of the harp? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And then when it came to Italy, Italian harps were much thinner and so there wasn't room to spread out the two rows in the same way. Yeah. So the Italians put their two rows of strings parallel and then they decided it worked even better if they had three rows of strings. So the triple harps appeared sort of just before the year 1600 in Italy. So we have Monteverdi composing pieces with solos for the triple harp, yeah. but they still called it arpa doppia which sounds like it ought to be just a double harp with two rows, but it just means a harp that was much bigger than the other harps of the time. And, and did, the, did the chromatic harp, this funny one, survive? I mean, we, we don't see any of those these days, really. It did survive in Spain and in South America, but in Italy and in the rest of Europe, they took up this parallel row version. Yeah. And that's what came to England, 
and eventually to Wales. And there it mixed with what really was Welsh, because there was a distinctive Welsh harp. Yeah. And the distinctive thing about it was the shape of the instrument, with the very, very high um, bass end of the instrument. <laughs> In fact, Handel wrote this concerto in 1736 for a Welshman, William Powell, who was one of my predecessors as an official harpist to the Prince of Wales. There were so many renowned Welsh players in London at this time that they became synonymous with the new triple harp. harp became a popular instrument in Wales. It accompanied dancing in the pubs and fairs and was played in the great houses. By the 19th century it had died out in the rest of Europe but the Welsh had well and truly adopted it as their own. Yeah, right. Surprisingly, for an instrument that is so difficult to play, the triple harp is still thriving and being taught in the traditional oral method. I went to pick up some tips from Sio Hverch, who can trace her unbroken teacher-pupil lineage back to the 14th century. Her greatest influence was one of her teachers, Nancy Richards, who was known as the Queen of the Welsh Harp. But, you know, her lessons were, were not what you could say, you know, something very structured at all. You have to be very sharp to pick up things. Why? With what would her. her lessons be like? Well, you know, she'd, she'd present you with something, and then you'd have to watch and listen, and then you'd have to. Remember all that and uh, work on it and practice on it until she came the next time. So there was never any music? No, never. Never any music. No. So com completely by, by, by ear? By know? ear. And I think, you see, that has given shape to my sort of improvisation. And is it always based on a, on a traditional tune or a traditional melody or is it sometimes...? Mostly. It is. I would say 90% of my arrangements, uh, compositions, are melody-based, the traditional airs.
these are these look a bit like skeleton harps yeah, to me. Right. I mean, here we have the sound box, the neck, the pillar, yeah. and then the bass. So is this the harp complete? For what concerns the the wood, yes. Yeah. Of course, as you can see, we don't have strings, we don't have the action, we don't no. have the pedals, yeah. and the varnish. But yes, so the wood uh, has been completed, yeah. and uh, we assemble all those elements together uh, one first time to see that each part had been made properly. Yeah. Uh, everything is okay. After this moment, uh, once everything had been checked, we disassemble again uh, okay. the harp, and we go on with the production. Put all the bits right. in. The triple harp had certainly captured the imagination of the Welsh, but in Spain, the harp had taken a very different direction. Spanish harps were usually very broad in the bass mm. and very deep in the bass as well, but very shallow and narrow in the treble. And because of this crossed over stringing, yeah. you have to play with your right hand right at the top of the strings, right. your left hand in the middle. And so the construction and your hand position make the right hand sound quite fierce, almost metallic. Right. The left hand sound is sort of much darker, more resonant. And the Spanish really liked this contrast between the two hands. And so they went one stage further, yeah. which was to grow long nails, but only on the right hand, like a guitarist does, right. to get that sort of bright guitar sound in the right hand, and then a more resonant fingertip sound in the left hand. Would you say that maybe the Spanish tradition, they were actually trying to make the harps sound like guitars? Absolutely. Everything in Spanish music is based around the guitar. Yeah. So the books that teach you how to play the harp assume that you already know how to play the guitar. Really? And they... Although it's completely different, though. Oh, yeah. But the guitar was just so standard that everybody understood it. And so they say, yep, if you play a chord in the right hand, that's like playing a down strum on the guitar. Yeah. And if you play a single note, that's like playing an up strum. Yeah. And if I was to go to Spain tomorrow, would I, would I still see this harp in action there or not? Probably not so much in Spain, where this style of instrument and this also this style of playing has survived is more in South America, because right. the Spanish took their Baroque harps across to South America and each instrument sort of seeded a local tradition in harp building, and that's where we have our different South American harps from. Here in Venezuela, the harp is their national instrument and the heart and soul of their rhythmic dance, Joropo. Carnevali, a leading expert on Venezuelan music, about the joropo. I suppose the most important thing about joropo is that it has a harp. The harp is the most important instrument in it. Harp, which never plays alone. At least it has to play with the maracas. But it also usually plays with a cuatro, which is a small uh, four-string guitar. And then it can also play with a mandolin and with a bandola, which is a kind of lute, uh, plucked string instrument. So you have the maracas, which are come from the indigenous people. You have the Baroque musical structure of the Spaniards and you have the polyrhythms of the Africans. 
And that combination is quite explosive. It has a, a, dy a dynamism and a, and a kind of joy which is very contagious. Yeah. Can I just have a little fiddle around? Ella, como no. Thank you. No, I don't know, it's fine. Thank you. <laughs> it is only one row of strings, but it's almost as difficult to play as a triple harp. And just to confuse me further, the color coding on the strings is different too. Usually the red string is a C and the black an F, but they obviously have a different system here. to Barquisimeto, the musical capital of Venezuela, to meet Carlos Orozco, the foremost harpist in the country. His experimental approach pushes the frontiers of the joropo and the harp to its limits, but he has some rather unusual influences. Mi, mi influencia me, a mí me decían cuando comencé a tocar el arpa llanera, yo no estudiaba, yo estudié varios arpistas así venezolanos, pero estudié más los de, este, que no tenían nada que ver con el arpa, como Steve Wonder, the music of Michael Jansson, of Billy Joy, yeah. the Billy Joy, Elton John, o sea, <laughs> personas que no tenían nada. Everything. Sí. So many Ese things. Que estaba crazy, loco. Es una esencia del llanero, o sea que cuando se toca un joro pues tramado es como un becerrero, o sea algo que se, se habla de las mangas y coleos, joro pues el llano entero, o sea, y bueno joro pues todo va a ser rítmica agresivo, rápido, chico, 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 todo lo que es rápido, yeah. como una cabalgata chiquitita ahí. This is Los Llanos, home of the Llaneros, the Venezuelan cowboys. It's a tough life here, with these vast open plains completely flooded for six months of the year. The Llaneros spend all day in the saddle, and when they return to the ranch at the end of the day, the way they unwind is not what I would have expected at all. These are cowboys. These are people who deal with cattle and animals all the time. There are vast horizons where they ride and uh, they connect with nature in many ways. And they sing to all that. They sing yeah. to the cattle. Right. Uh, there is a famous saying by Simon Diaz who says, you cannot lace 50 heads of cattle with a rope, you can with a song. Hey! 
Although the Spanish cross-strung harp and the triple harp had extended the musical possibilities of the instrument, neither had fully answered the needs of European composers. During the 18th century, there were many attempts at developing a mechanical device to make it easier to change keys. The earliest attempts were in Bavaria, but the most significant developments were in France. très grande tradition de l'harpe en France. Euh, cette tradition s'est perdue pendant assez longtemps jusqu'à ce que la reine Marie-Antoinette, qui venait d'Autriche, euh, amène dans ses bagages une harpe et commence à la jouer à la cour de France. Et euh, évidemment, je veux dire, euh, comme toujours, quand euh, euh, le roi ou la reine aime quelque chose, tout le monde suit. Donc euh, l'aristocratie française, euh, les jeunes femmes de l'aristocratie ont commencé à jouer beaucoup de, de cet instrument. Après que Marie-Antoinette ait aidé au développement de la harpe, il y a un luthier français qui s'appelait Sébastien Hérard, qui s'est pris de passion pour l'instrument et qui a cherché à développer la technique instrumentale, la facture de l'instrument. Sebastian Erard's remarkable invention, I visited one of my first teachers and mentor, Eleanor Bennett. This particular instrument was made in 1807 by Sebastian Erard, and the pedal mechanism is a very, um, well, very clever, really, because the pedal, by pressing one of the pedals down, you immediately sharpen the sound of each string mm. uh, and of course you know that this pedal is going to be a C pedal yeah. and we're going to press this down and the C becomes a, a yeah. natural comes as sharp yeah. this particular one is called a single action harp because you can only move the pedal once, once. Yeah, from right. flats to natural or from natural to sharp okay so now we move on to the Erard double action yeah so this you can see now here the, that there is there are two discs here on the C string. Uh -huh. The red sing again, a string again is the C. So that open, that disc is open and that disc is open. Now if I press the pedal down once, it becomes engaged and, and sharpens it. Yeah. If I press it down again, that one yeah. also sharpens. So it's, there's a whole tone difference between that and the bottom. And this is essentially the harp we have today? It is. It is essentially in terms of what the pedal, pedal mechanism does. Mm. It's exactly the same. Donc les compositeurs ont commencé à s'intéresser vraiment très sérieusement et c'est ainsi que euh, jusqu'à l'entrée du XXe siècle, la harpe a, a suivi son parcours jusqu'à ce que la, en France il y ait un, un courant musical qui s'est appelé impressionnisme et qui a été développé par des compositeurs comme Forêt, Ravel, Debussy et qui ont trouvé que la harpe correspondait tout à fait euh, à ce qu'ils cherchaient en musique, c'est-à-dire un, un jeu de couleurs tout à fait unique. Ravel was commissioned to write this piece to demonstrate the range and versatility of the Erard concert pedal harp. It has since become one of the most popular and famous pieces in the harp's repertoire. Thank you. 
what would be the difference between this harp and this new harp, which, you know, is maybe... How, how old is that one? This one is 1904. Yeah. This was 80 years older. Right. Younger. 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 Made younger. in 1984. Yeah. Um, in, in Germany, this one. The difference in this one is... is the sound box, Yes, right? and it, it's been made to sound big in a big hall. And it's also... <laughs> needs to respond to a much stronger technique by the player. So um, the harp had to be strengthened. If you use the same power on this harp, say, on the little single action, yes. the sound would be very ugly, I think. Yeah. Because, um, you how, know, would, how would that sound? So if you... That's quite a lot of sound. I put yeah. a lot of strength there. Yeah. Now then it's going to be a different chord now, but if I did the same power on that one a bit... Right. It's really ugly. Yeah. If I tried it on the triple harp, I'd <laughs> be really afraid of breaking it, so I don't know if I should do it or not. I'll try. <laughs> Elastic sorry, bands. I'm so sorry. It's <laughs> yeah, not something okay. one should do. The harp was now a real contender as a solo instrument. The 20th century saw a flowering of writing for the concert harp. One composer who realised its potential was Benjamin Britten. He told me, I, I'd like to write a piece for you. It was rather funny, actually. The year before, he said, I, I'd like to, to, you to introduce a programme at Albury Festival next year. I'd like to call it Artist Choice. You are to choose the music and choose the players, and if you like, you can commission a new piece from any composer whom you care to mention. <laughs> So he meant it was from him. And it came in the post, and I had a rehearsal with him ne uh, three days later uh, of the War Requiem. So I decided I must try and learn this for him and play it back to him. So at the end of the rehearsal, I said to him, would you like to hear the harp suite? And he said, yes. And I played it to him, and he was very pleased. He was purring like a cat. Not because I'd learnt it quickly, but because it worked. Yeah. And he was a great craftsman, and it was a great pleasure to him that it had worked. What he'd written in the letter beforehand with the music was, uh, if it's uh, awkward or, or d things don't work, send it back to me as uh, unfit work sort of thing, which yeah. is ridiculous. He wrote so well for any instrument. <laughs>
from the very first piece of wood that we saw to the now finished harp mm. with strings and all, how long has that taken? Uh, let's say six months uh, for, for the more sim simpler ones, up to one year. Wow. Yeah. So, and that's for each harp? Yes. Yeah. So it's, 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 quite, it's quite an achievement to, to have a finished harp. Absolutely. Soloists are not the only ones who are being stretched by the requirements of contemporary composers. Leading composers such as Pierre Boulez are always searching for new sounds and effects, which can prove to be very challenging for orchestral players as well. You probably think that because it's contemporary music, if one note is not quite in tune, it might not be so important as in the Rossini. Yes. Forget it. Um, you know, you can play one note in contemporary music and the conductor will say, well, Boulez would say, um, the third F on the fourth semi-quiver or the fifth quiver is a little bit flat. No way. In the middle of the orchestra and he can stop and just, that's it. He'll make you tune in front of everyone and just make it sure. It's perfect. Oh it's very exacting and yeah. very nerve-wracking. And what are some of the most obscure things that you've been asked to do? Uh, well, I have done Sprechgesang, which is singing into the back of the harp while it's playing, you know. Right. You know which, is, which, which, which is hilarious, but it's very difficult because you've got here, you're supposed to be watching the conductor who's there, the music stands there, you've got a player in front of you, you're trying to sing and you're trying to play. And then there's one piece of Boulez, which I think you have there. This one? Le Soleil, which we played in Boulez's 80th birthday concert. Um, and at the end of it, you'll see there's a trill. But yeah. the trill is right at the bottom, down there. Right. So he says, it cannot be done, no? It cannot be done? And I said, yeah, I can do it. Um, there is a way. Now, let's see. Just I'm, before it... An arm extension. Yes, well, just before it, there is this, which is pressing the hand on there, making this noise. But I have to bring this hand here but to make that noise, whilst counting and watching the beat. And that's after playing something here, which is harmonic. And then down here, there's... And whilst counting, <laughs> solo trill, getting quieter and quieter at the bottom of the harp. And he said, that's very good, it's very good. <laughs> yeah. Yes, because it could be done. Inspired by 20th century avant-garde composers, such as John Cage with his use of a prepared piano, Rodri Davis is pushing the boundaries even further by creating and discovering new sounds on his specially adapted harp. So, Rodri, can you try and explain a little bit of all what's sort of what's happening here? And yeah, it's, it's basically a, a traditional harp uh, made by John Thomas, and it was his son, actually, Alan Thomas. Yeah. Um, and it's amplified, um, and it goes through a mixing desk down here yeah. and various effect pedals. Um, I've also pre-recorded uh, some of the harp sounds, and I play those back whilst I improvise. Yeah. Um, also, all these uh, preparations. Yeah, what, what are all the bits and bobs we've got? They they just um, change the sound, so you get get different qualities. What are they? These are like little peg things. Those are little crocodile clips. Yeah. And then you have these things, which make a more rhythmic sound. Um, these are electronic bows, e bows, which usually have electric guitars. Right. And they produce a magnetic wave. Wow. Which makes a sound like that. 
Yeah. OK, so, Rodri, can we do a little duet? Of course. Um, you, you play the strings right. and I'll play the, the electronics. OK. And uh, we'll see what happens. All right. So where next? An electronic invention to replace the complicated pedal mechanism, perhaps? Or possibly, as contemporary music evolves, a return to the older, more simple forms of the harp? This journey has revealed an instrument that has constantly evolved and adapted as a reaction to changing musical requirements. Who knows where its future lies? Thank you. 